What's up, Lost Tribe? Welcome to a special interview show we have today for you. It's not our regular Monday night show, uh, but all the regular players are here. Jesse, why don't you say hello? What's going on? Hey, Brian. Hey, Pastor Rock community. I'm excited to be talking here uh, with our special guest, which Brian will introduce in just a second, but special edition. If you're a Jewish athlete, you will want to hear this interview, so stay tuned. Yeah, we have a, we're proud to introduce our Major League Baseball prospect, recent high school graduate, which is great, especially in these COVID times, proud member of the tribe, our friend Ellie Kligman. Ellie, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? We're doing great. We're doing great. Really excited to talk to you. we got a ton of topics to cover that we know our community and a bunch of people out there want to hear from you. Um, but you've made news over the past few months, you know, beginning your journey into hopefully professional sports, maybe even a college stop on the way, which we'll talk about while remaining observant uh, of, Ju of your Judaism. So we want to get right into it. We're going to start with baseball. Jesse, get us kicked off. All right, Ellie, why don't you just tell us, tell us a bit about your start in baseball, uh, what sports you played growing up and kind of just your, your journey into the baseball world. Yeah, so I started playing baseball in a league, I guess was t-ball and I was like six years old um but I played all three sports pretty much until I moved to Vegas when I was 10 uh basketball football baseball um baseball is always my main focus and that was the sport I loved the most so I just kind of stuck with that and that was kind of the only sport I did uh through middle school and high school and I guess that's uh, worked out pretty well so far yeah and we've seen that you're really quite the jack of all trades I guess when it comes to position what was the first position that you played I think it was shortstop but when you're younger, you, you, you play every position. So I was just kind of moving around every inning. So I just kind of learned to keep doing that as I got older, which I learned was very helpful because the more positions you play, the more opportunity the coach has to put you in the game. So, so thinking about it, I have a two-part question for you. So tell us a little bit about where you played in high school and kind of like where you're thinking about like what, what you're looking at as far as college, what position to play. And then outside of that, what's a position you wish you could play every once in a while that you never get to play anymore? So interestingly enough, the only position I have not played in high school is catcher. And that is probably what I'm going to do in college. So my freshman year, I was in the outfield and first base. I just kind of was in the outfield and on the center field, the patient went to center on the first base and pitch I went to first. So I was just kind of moving around a little bit there. And then my sophomore year, I think I was playing third pitching one game and I was playing short in the second too. So it was kind of where, whoever was pitching that day, I just went to their position. Um, and then junior year, I was the shortstop and pitcher and the same thing for senior year. Um, a position, probably the outfield, a position that I would, I don't ever get to play. I haven't played in a long time. It's pretty fun out there. Yeah, I mean, outfield is a position when you're young, you know, you hate to play that because everybody, all the kids think that that's where uh, they put the uh, bad players or whatever. But then once you get to high school, that's where all the action is, right? You want to be part of that and obviously beyond. Um, so that, that I agree. That's something that I think if you're, if you're pitching, you're playing in the infield forever, you look back and you're like, hey, I'd like to run around out there a little bit, make some plays from the outfield. Um, what's that first moment while you were playing that you kind of thought, uh, you're like, this might be something special. This might be something I could be really good at. I don't know if it was just one moment. Um, but I do have to say it was probably when I got to high school because I was a freshman on varsity and I think I hit like 350 something. I threw a no hitter that year. Um, I just kind of had a really good year overall. Um, it was only like my third year hitting lefty. So like with all of that, I just kind of realized this is something I can do at the next level because I'm already 15 playing against, you know, 18, 19 year olds. My like the last game of my freshman year, I was pitching against Austin Wells, who was the first rounder at the Yankees this past year. And he was 19 years old, like a full beard. And I'm just like this 15 year old kid. I mean, he hit me around, but just kind of playing with those older kids made me realize I could do it. What was the, uh, what's the most impressive uh, stadium, city, and or tournament you've played in uh, as a young professional? So tournament, I would have to say the PBR Futures Games. Um, so when I went there after my sophomore year of high school, we, it was at the Lake Point Complex in Georgia. And it's all uncommitted kids from the different um, regions of PBR that each PBR kind of brings a team. So when I was there, it was like 300 college coaches every game like just packed. It was crazy. That was best stadium. Um, it's a good one. Um, 
I would say one of the better ones is probably the um, like the main field at Cary, North Carolina, at the USA Complex. The kind of the stadium is super nice there. Yeah, I mean, coaching travel ball when my son was going through, if they had a, a hook on, in the dugout that they could put their bag or their helmet, that was impressive to them. So, like, hearing about going off and, you know, coming from the West Coast, playing in Georgia, that must have been amazing. Obviously, you know, kind of surrounding yourself with other players that are on that same path as you. And, you know, invite only is always, you know, really it has to be really exciting just to be kind of in that that group with everyone else that you know everybody's got the same dream you're kind of like wanting to be supportive but you're also checking people out and you know I'm better than this guy or you know where how do I stack yeah. up yeah another good one is the Las Vegas ballpark here at the AAA stadium for the A's um there's a lot of events there and stuff that PBR does and like the end of the high school season I think is there too that stadium is super nice so, you know, where, where are you on your path? I know you just graduated from high school. Have you committed to, um, you know, a college or university at this point? Where are you kind of been recruiting? So I have not committed yet. Um, I do have offers, but I'm um, just because of COVID, the financial situation of a lot of schools has changed and has caused me to have to wait. Um, but it could get solved kind of around the draft time. So I have options. It's just a matter of um, waiting for them to kind of come together. Yeah, but college baseball is a tough one because, you know, they don't, you know, not many people know this, but not everybody on the team is full scholarship like they are with football and some basketball programs. So I'd imagine uh, there's a lot of wait and see and a lot of let me see what I can do and half scholarship here or full scholarship there. Um, when did those letters start to come in? Like when did th throughout your high school career did the recruiting thing really kind of pop up? So I didn't get recruited until... Um, my so summer after my sophomore year of high school. So a lot of my, a lot of kids on my team that I played with, they'd already committed and, you know, had a ton of offers and stuff, but I wasn't a super toolsy kid at that time. You know, I was only throwing like low eighties. Um, you know, I wasn't the strongest kid in the field. Um, but I did get a couple of schools talking to me technically like before that deadline um, of September 1st of your junior year. And then once that deadline hit, I think I had like, a total of 12 schools, but I wasn't getting like super heavily recruited. Um, and then through the fall, I kept talking to a lot of those schools and then COVID hit and then half of them just disappeared. Um, yeah. Half of them told me I'll talk to you again in the fall, which they never did. Um, and, you know, that was, COVID was the tough thing for me in college recruiting because my junior year, summer after my junior year, was the year I was going to get recruited a lot because I was throwing harder. I could hit the ball further. Like, I was upper 80s. I can hit a lot of home runs. And that was the summer I was going to get recruited a lot. But obviously, COVID hit. So that was kind of a, a tough summer to get a, to have off and with no college coaches there. So that kind of worked out pretty poorly for me. Luckily, I was able to send some videos to some schools, and that's how we kind of got um, – they got interested, and we kind of kept talking through it. Um, also helped that I made the area code games in the summer and I did some, some cool events, but, um, with COVID, it was super tough to get offers because they only give 11 and a half scholarships for like a 30 man roster. So, you know, those numbers don't really go together very well. So obviously not a lot of kids are getting full scholarships. So like that made it a lot tougher. Plus unlimited rosters, more players, less money makes it harder. So that's why we kind of have to wait longer. Given that uh, you had quite the off season, I guess, with COVID, what, what did you do to stay in shape? Like, what's your training regimen? So when COVID hit and all the gyms were closed, I was just doing stuff at my house, just at bins. And I found out I got a ladder. Um, I was honestly lifting with cinder blocks. Like, we didn't even have weights around the house. We couldn't buy them. They were all sold out. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of doing, like, that kind of stuff. I was going to the field every day. Um, and then when uh, the gyms opened back up, I was in there, like, four times a week, kind of getting back into it. And then games started. So I was kind of more back in my summer flow, I guess you could say. Awesome. So word on the street is uh, you were raised in San Diego, but aren't a Padres fan. Just to, to come clean, I'm in New Orleans. I'm probably the farthest from San Diego and still a Padres fan. Uh, Tony Gwynn, don't ask me why. It's not about me today. As you know, how did you, were you just kind of 
not a Padres fan because of how terrible they were, which I totally understand. What do you think about the team this year? Are you excited about what they're doing? Cover of um, MLB The Show, 21, everything like that. Uh, where do you, where's your Padres fandom right now? All right. So my dad had a client on the Phillies when I was younger, Carlos Ruiz. So that was the team I watched growing up. So when I was in kindergarten, they won the World Series in 08. So that was the team that I grew up watching. And they were really good when I was growing up. So that was the team I was just stuck with. So I am a Phillies fan. However, I do not dislike the Padres because <laughs> I am from San Diego. Um, I That team is super fun to watch. I mean, Tatis is obviously the most exciting player in baseball. And that's a really good team. So um, I think what they're doing for the game of baseball is amazing. Um, making the game more exciting and a lot more fun to watch for a lot of people. So, you know, hopefully the league kind of goes in that trend. Yeah, I mean, and what's crazy is he's gotten injured twice this season, both on swinging too hard. Uh, nothing to do with what he's doing in the field. He's doing splits out in the field, doing everything. You're right, a pretty exciting player. Um, what's your favorite, most epic baseball moment from your career? What's the one memory or maybe a couple memories of like, I really came through and, and you mentioned a no-hitter. Is that it? Is it something else? It probably has to be the no-hitter. Um, from what I'm told, I was the first freshman in Nevada history that ever throw a no-hitter on varsity. Um, and I touched 80 once in that game, <laughs> not throwing very hard. So that was cool. Um, I don't know about another moment. That's probably any, the one that stands out. Any, any bombs you just crushed out of the park? I did hit one this, like, not this, uh, before the season started in the spring, that I hit it and I was like, I just sat there and watched it. Like, <laughs> I was like, that was cool. Yeah, nice. So so you said you're a Phillies fan, and I hear that you like Roy Halladay. Is, uh, is he one of your favorite players of all time? And who's your favorite player in the MLB right now? Uh, yeah, he's my favorite player of all time. Um, again, I was super young when I was watching him pitch, and I always just kind of saw the, the way he went about playing the game and how he played, um, the way he tried to pitch people, his attitude towards the game, and obviously he was really good. Mm -hmm. So just – I actually got to meet him one time in San Diego, actually. Um, there was like a Pony League day at the Petco Park. So we were all there and then the Phillies were in town. So my dad talked to Carlos and he was like, can we, uh, if you could try to get some of the, some of the players. It was, I think it was like a uh, extra clubhouse or something. I don't know where it was, but they had us. So our team went in there, me and my brother's team went in there. And then Carlos walked in with Roy Holiday, Cliff Lee and Placido Polanco. Nice. Wow. Yeah. That was cool. How old were you at the time? I was nine, I think. Wow. Yeah, I mean, Jesse's from Toronto. So yeah. Obviously there's uh, a Roy Jason. Holiday connection there. there. Yeah. Nice. What, um, who do you think is your MLB player comparison? What kind of career, if you look at, um, you know, players in the MLB, what kind of career do you want to have or do you think you can have based on your skill set? Um, I don't know if I could compare myself to one player. I kind of, I'm a little different than a lot of players. Um, switch hitting catcher that can pitch and play all nine positions. So it was kind of a little, uh, there's not really anybody exactly like that. So I think I can kind of make my own path, especially with the religious stuff and not playing on Shabbos and stuff. I think that I can kind of make my own thing there. Yeah, you should look up a player, Jose Okendo, played for St. Louis, the St. Louis Cardinals, probably in the late 80s. I'll go ahead and, you know, I'm the old person on this, uh, this podcast. Um, but look him up because he played all nine positions. I can't remember if it was in one game or in one season, but um, one of the fantasy baseball leagues I play in is named after him for that reason. So if you think he can play them all, there's there's your uh, there's your player you can check out. I would definitely have to check him out. I love that answer though. You'll be the first Ellie Kligman. Um, who are your who are your role model models, either inside or outside of baseball? Um, I would say probably the biggest one is obviously my dad you know he taught me to play baseball and you know he coached me a lot growing up um you know introduced me to a lot of big leaguers who have helped me along the way with my skill set um so i just have to, definitely have to say him on and off the field for sure mm. cool so let's move on you know you've got a lot of press uh for your decision not to play uh baseball on shabbat so walk us through that what what led you to that decision what you know what does that mean to you um, it was never really just one decision. It was just kind of the way, this the way I was doing it when I was in Little League and Pony League and travel ball and everything. So it was never like a thought where 
um, I'm going to stop this or I'm going to keep doing it. It was just kind of like, this is the way it is and this is how I'm going to do it. Um, when I played Little League, when I was like up until I think I was seven, uh, we would miss like 60% of the games. Like no one would change any games for us. So um, my dad went to the uh, Pony, North City Pony League in San Diego. And uh, he went to the board and told them our situation, who he was and what we were trying to do. And they all voted to not give us any regular season games or playoff games on Chavez. So that was kind of our first experience. We realized people will help you if you want to, um, if you show that you're strong in what you, you're believing and what you're going to do, people will do their best to help you. Um, and now they, when I made the All-Star team that year, they, well, they couldn't change um, the All-Star League um, schedule because there was too many, it was teams from different cities and stuff. So it was kind of hard to do. So I, we got eliminated that day, like on a day that I missed. And about, like, a lot of the kids from the team came to our house on Chavez and just kind of told us the news and hung out with us all day. So I think when that started to happen, we realized that um, this is possible to do because people are always willing to help you. How, is, um, how have your teammates been in like kind of supporting that decision not to play on Shabbat? And I mean, have you ever received any criticism for it? And like, what's the answer to that? I have never received criticism from any of my teammates for this. I have only had, um, in, like people are always asking questions about it. Like, what do you do on this day? Like, can you eat? Or like, not, not always informed questions, but always in questions. And they're always wanting to learn more about it. And they're always super supportive of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a great topic of conversation for people to learn more about, you know, what are the traditional customs on Shabbat and, you know, uh, how that fits in learning from, you know, what you're doing as an example. Um, what do you what is the conversation like with college or MLB scouts? Um, you know, obviously, college baseball, they are essentially playing four days a week, Tuesday, and then either, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So what are those conversations like? Have you gotten any negative feedback from them? We just can't recruit you because you're going to miss uh, too many games. So no coach has actually told me we are not going to recruit you because of this. I've been told that schools have just not reached out to me because of it, but they weren't really any schools I wanted to go to anyway, so it was all good. Um, but the coaches that I'm talking to currently, um, they want to help me because they think I can help them pretty much. So like if, if I'm good enough to help a team win, they're going to want to help me get on the field, obviously. So I think the, well, I know the schools that, that I'm talking to now, they believe that, or the coaches believe that they can, they can get games um, adjusted, I guess. So let's say there's a game on Friday night at seven o'clock. If you just move that game to three o'clock, I can play. So it's not like you have to move it full days. You just have to move it a couple hours. And a Saturday game, you can just move to Saturday night, which is a Saturday night game is not uncommon either. So, and also for the other teams, they're only changing one or two games in their whole season. Because if we were only playing them once, so if you just change the game a couple hours and they're only moving one or two games a year, so it doesn't really affect them very much. So I think. And also in the day and age that we live in where it's all about inclusion and, you know, kind of, yeah, including everybody and what they want to do and who they, what they believe in, I think that this is definitely possible to do. And so you'd say the baseball world has been pretty, I mean, welcoming and inclusive of not playing on Shabbat and kind of trying to make it work around your schedule? Yeah, I think the people that believe um, that it's possible have, you know, given me the positive feedback and the people that don't think it's possible haven't talked to me. So I don't really care. Um, <laughs> And the pro scouts, it's almost e easier in pro ball because in the minor leagues, they'll play 142 games. If you don't play one or two games a week, that's pretty normal. Especially if you're, if I'm a catcher in pro ball, if I'm not, if I'm catching four or five days a week, that's just about a, as much as anyone else will catch. So I there would think go. it'd be easier in pro ball too. Because you're so out there in public with being Jewish and the steps you're taking to, uh, you know, not playing on Shabbat. What have you experienced any anti-Semitism out in either in or out of the baseball world because you're so you're kind of a public figure already uh, and being a, a public Jewish figure as well? Um, I have not received that I've seen. Um, I don't know if it's out there or what's going on, but I've seen negative comments on posts and stuff where they're like, this is never going to happen and stuff like that. But I've never seen anything anti-Semitic about it. Do you, uh, do you ever take a step back and kind of look at the big picture, like the example that you're setting for the next generation of Jewish baseball players? Like this is seriously like a, a big, you know, a big step for, uh, for young Jewish baseball players looking to go pro. Um, for sure. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, that's one of the goals I'm trying to accomplish here is 
show people, not only Jewish people, but everybody, that um, you don't have to sacrifice your religion to do what you want to do in life. Um, and if I can set that example, um, however I can do it, and obviously I have currently have a little bit of a platform to do that, then I'm happy to do it. And I also want to, I think one thing that I try to do is I, wanna, I don't want um, the outside attention to affect what I do in the field. So when my mindset's on the field, my mindset is just on baseball. Like I don't think about anything else, which, you know, obviously I think, I think is a good thing for um, being, able, being able to perform. But um, I definitely look back and I do think about that. And I do, and I think, I think it's super cool that I get a chance to do that. So we we were able to meet you through uh, you were you were involved with Team Israel uh, when they were practicing um, on the West Coast. What? How did you get involved with that? What do you? What does the future hold for you as far as that goes? And you know, obviously they'll be competing in the Olympics this year in Japan. So uh, what what has that path been like? And how did you get involved? So I got involved because one of the um, I think it's like one of the operators of Team Israel. Um, he knows my dad and he saw all the articles about me. So he reached out and wanted me to come work out in the, with them in Arizona and then uh, the summer on the East Coast. So that's how I got involved. Um, and in terms of, they couldn't give me a passport or not a passport, a uh, citizenship for Israel so I could go play in Tokyo. So I don't know if I would have made a team or not, but I, I, I can't go anyway, so. I mean, hopefully in the World Baseball Classic in a couple of years, I can play there. We'd, uh, we'd love to see you there, um, you know, putting on for us. Uh, what advice would you give to some of those young Jewish players who might be contemplating their observance as it relates to baseball and kind of coexisting, um, you know, with their their athletic schedule? So what, what advice would you give to, to some of those young players? Um, the biggest thing I would say is that you have to stay strong in your belief, um, in your religion. Because if you waver in it, people will see that and they won't want to um, help you, um, you know, adjust game times, adjust game days and stuff like that. If you tell them, you know, I'm not playing at all, they'll be like, okay, so what can we do? We can change can we move this game this day or can we have two games on Sunday instead of two games on Saturday or something like that. But if you say I can play a playoff game on Saturday or something like that, then they're going to be like, okay, if we just schedule, he's going to play anyway. So I think staying strong in your belief makes people want to help you more. Mm. Yeah, so just being like, you know, confident in it, in it uh, and like kind of setting the bar for what your expectations are. And then, like you said, you just let your game talk for itself and, and people want that. Exactly. People will see the weakness if they can uh, and if they'll, you know, they won't help you as much if they can see that weakness. So on Pass the Rock, we actually talk about a lot of different sports, basketball, football, baseball, a little bit of everything. But I want to ask you a hard hitting question that we covered uh, about a month ago. And the question is, do you allow pineapple to be put on pizza? I do. Pineapple on Ugh. pizza is good. Mm. Oh, so Jesse, you I lose don't know, that. I don't know what people see that's so bad about it. Me either. I'm, I'm pro pineapple. Jesse, Jesse's anti pineapple. You know, I just had to get that clear. Uh, Jesse, any other uh, arguments we've had you want to bring up? Uh, let him answer Ooh. some questions. I mean, we had like, what's the best ice cream flavor? And it was basically chocolate versus vanilla. Uh, I'm not sure what your take on that is. I'm going to need a little more diversity than that. <laughs> um, I mean, you can, you can go outside the box too. You can go cookie sure. dough. I mean, if I, between vanilla and chocolate, I am going vanilla. There um, we go. So Jesse doesn't like me anymore. <laughs> um, although strawberry and cookies and cream, kind of better than vanilla. So. Yep. Agreed. Interesting. Obviously, Ellie's an old soul. He's going to side with the old guy on these uh, these questions. What's your favorite sport outside of baseball? What do you like, you know, just hanging out watching? Uh, watching football. I am a big Chargers fan. That I do have from San Diego. There you go. Uh, <laughs> they left you. You Chargers didn't leave them. Fan, but um, I definitely have stuck with them. Uh, I don't have a favorite basketball team, but I'd rather play basketball. I'd it's the power to just like play a game, football, or basketball. I probably play basketball, but I like watching football a lot more. Unfortunately, I was born into being a Charger fan, but you know. Well, this this wouldn't be a baseball interview if we didn't ask you what is the best Spitz flavor, and what what are some of your other go to baseball snacks. Best, best, I haven't had that in a while. They ban they're banning it from all the fields these days. Really? Because <laughs> they don't want us spitting. Yeah. True. Makes sense. Um, 
I was a big cracked pepper guy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're back on. You're back in the good books. I used to get those uh, the big pound bags, and I'd bring them to practice. And like half the team would like it would be gone by the day because everyone mm-hmm. steal from me. But I learned you, you got to get the medium one and just stick in your back pocket all day. Yeah. And yeah, in the outfield with the batting gloves. Too, and dill pickle. Mm-hmm. Um, I forgot what the purple one is. Um, barbecue. No, that's the red one. Orange is barbecue. Purple's like it's some weird flavor. <laughs> I forgot what it was. It's pretty good too. Um, gum is also good. I don't really do much else besides uh, season gum. You do big big league chew. I do big league chew. I don't chew gum a lot though. Mm-hmm. I don't really like to be chewing when I'm at the plate, but fair enough. Some people yeah, like yeah. it. When you're not uh, practicing baseball, what what kind of things do you do? What do you, what do you do in your free time? Um, video games. That's the big one. Um, and obviously just hanging out with my friends and stuff, but I would say video games. What's your favorite video game? Depends on the season, but right now it's only the show. I got into UFC, so I was into UFC four. So I was, I got pretty good at that. So I, I was pretty much on UFC four and only the show for a while. So when you play MLB The Show, this is a personal question, okay? I have a 12-year-old. He plays certain um, game modes in MLB The Show. I play only one every time, every season. What's your favorite game mode to play on MLB The Show? So for years, I was always franchised. Mm-hmm. I love playing franchise. I still like playing it. You know, it's cool. You get to, you know, you're a GM. It's fun. Um, and then last year, I got really bored of it because – you know, I don't know why I got bored. So I was like, I'm going to try Diamond Dynasty. And I got super into Diamond Dynasty. It's super competitive. And I just, I always went, it was quarantine. So I had nothing else to do. So I was just playing hours of, hours of Diamond Dynasty. So I would have to say Diamond Dynasty. Okay. You know, yeah. you might you might be the one who ends up with MLB putting an option in Road to the Show for your player to not play on Shabbos. That needs to be in the game, you know, at and some they, point. Do they have a two-way guy now? Can you do it? Can you be a two-way in Road to the Show? In Road to the Show, you can't. The reason I asked you the question is that's the mode I play all the time is Road to the Show. I never got nearly as far uh, in my baseball career as you have. Mm. Uh, my 12-year-old, though, he's all about Diamond Dynasty and just, you know, like you said, hours and hours and packs and whatever. Uh, so he's sucked into the money-making machine that is, uh, you know, all of those different card kind of modes. But, but yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you can be a, two day, a two-way player now and start as a pitcher and a, and a fielder. A couple of years ago, I think it was like – I only feel 18. I had a, I had a road to the show guy was like a 99 overall, and he I I would just transfer him over to every game, and he didn't transfer over to like 19 or 20, so I just gave up. Oh uh, yeah. I mean you're you're playing road to the show in real life. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean if you're not doing anything at 8 o'clock p.m., uh, we got a road to the show tournament tonight. I mean if you want to show off your stick skills. Yeah, the uh, problem is I am busy at 5 p.m. my time. Mm-hmm. That was like the one time I was busy today, too. I got another baseball question for you. What's your walk-up song? So my walk-up song this year was Public Service Announcement by Jay-Z. Nice. <laughs> All right, you're, yeah, you're working your way on. back into the good books. <laughs> cool. What's, uh, you, what kind of advice do you have for young Jewish athletes, whether it's related to the sport they're playing, uh, to being Jewish in sports? What, what are some, uh, you know, we have a lot of kids that listen to us from all the way from eight, all the way up to 18. So what's some advice that you can give them? Um, on the baseball side of it, I would say, um, always challenging, challenging yourself to get better. So one, the one thing I've learned about um, practice is you want to test yourself to, to see what you can do. So like when I'm taking ground balls, I'm gonna try to charge the ball as hard as I can or try to do field it a certain way to see if I can do that on the field. And then if I can do it, I can I learn that I can, you know, try to perfect it as much as one can perfect something in baseball and um, kind of implement it in the field. So always testing yourself to be better has especially in the fielding part of it for me, I think is super good. Um, playing up when you when you get to the right age, obviously. I think is good because when you're playing against bigger, stronger kids, you learn to adjust. It get, makes you better because the better teammates you have, the better opponents you have, the more it pushes you to be a better baseball player. Great. So um, we want to just thank you for taking the time and being on Pass the Rock, being our first ever uh, athlete interview. And I'm sure that'll go down in history when you're you know, in the Hall of Fame years and years from now. 
but uh, we also want to wish you good luck. Um, you know, I know that I can imagine, I don't know, I can imagine that uh, going through the recruitment process and trying to figure all that during COVID has been uh, quite a mess, quite a lot to deal with. So good luck on that. Hopefully you can make the right decision for you um, and, um, and just good luck with your career. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been great talking to you. One last question before we let you go. Oh. Ketchup or mustard on a hot dog? I have to ask. I'm not a big hot dog guy to begin with, honestly. Um, probably ketchup. All right. You heard it here first. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going for the hamburger instead of the hot dog in the first place. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with passing on the hot dog, all right? That's mm -hmm. a great call. Don't worry about that at all. I don't even think I ate hot dogs until I was like 15. Like, <laughs> they were just disgusting to me. There you, go. there you go. Well, there's the hard hitting interviews that we always get yeah. with Pass the Rock. So thank you for joining us, Ellie. Thank you, everybody else, for listening. And we will see you on the next, next episode on Monday. Thanks.